Firth was a trainee doctor at the University of Pennsylvania in the 18th century who was so sure of his convictions that yellow fever was not contagious, he decided to use himself as a guinea pig. Guinea pigs, as we all know, were outlawed in Pennsylvania in the 18th century, so the only reasonable explanation was to use yourself or a beloved family member. It would only be years later until guinea pigs rose back into scientific prominence when NASA shot them up into exploding rockets. <laughs> uh, so Not rockets for the sole reason of exploding in space. Just seeing how far can a gerbil's guts fly. Yeah. Uh, that's how the best, I feel, like scientific um, things are created by accident. Like we were the accidental shooting of guinea pigs up into the atmosphere by rockets. A bunch of really, you know, sociopathic, sick-minded scientists were just like, "Let's kill animals," but then discovered spaceflight (laughs) as a, you know. I think it's the only thing holding us back from finding the cure for cancer. If you ask me, we haven't murdered enough animals. Yeah, we're not building enough prisons out of Legos. Maybe that'll do something. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, yellow fever pandemics at the time. Were, were pretty widespread. They were very detrimental to American society. Yeah, yellow fever, the summertime when yellow fever runs rampant, it's just you're guaranteed as a society to lose a massive number of people because they're going to contract yellow fever and die. That's just how the world worked. There was no penicillin. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no running water. Yeah, the the epidemic of 1793 mm-hmm. killed about 5,000 people. In Philly. In Philly. Which is about uh, 10% of that population back then. Now 10% of the population of Philadelphia, I assume, would be over a million. But, I mean, relatively, I mean, that's a huge number of people. It's just gone. We've talked about plagues a little bit. We talked about the Plague of Justinian in a past episode. Uh, this is on a much smaller scale and not at the you know bridge of the Eastern and Western worlds. Well as much as Philly likes to make themselves out to be the bridge of <laughs> the eastern and western worlds of the United States. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a huge blow to society. Uh, it's, but let's not forget about the Darren Drozdoff of science here. Uh, what what did Firth do with this vomit again? Firth drank the infected vomit of patients. Oh, God. Okay, okay, hold to on. To see if he can infect himself with yellow fever. Go ahead. Okay, I, I feel I feel like maybe we didn't give enough heads up uh-huh. to the listeners that this is not this is going to be a little queasy talk. At least this is how my I mother- feel like if they're listening to this podcast already, they already have strong stomachs. Here we go. He drank the infected vomit of patients as well as, and here we go, <laughs> cutting him smell, cutting him smelf, cu- <laughs> cutting his smurf, cutting his smurf, cutting himself, and smearing contaminated urine, blood, saliva. And other bodily fluids into his open wounds. Oh, my God. And if that wasn't enough, a connoisseur of fine wine, cheeses, deep fried pickles. Who I, knows? Loved, I love Noodle fried salad. Uh, all those things to relax on a fine, warm summer's afternoon. Uh, Stubby, uh, a man with notoriously sh- short thumbs. <laughs> he decided to distill... Infected people's vomit and make a fine black liqueur out of it. And this ain't, you know, your regular. Uh, this is where Kahlua. we get the idea of Kahlua from. Yeah, right? uh, this ain't your regular Kahlua. No, no. That just this tastes is like. yellow fever. Yeah, this is the. It's what Jay Z's drinking in the club. It's the hypnotic of its day. Yeah. You're distilling vomit? Yeah, distilling vomit and drink. Well, he was, he was sure in a scientific, hypo- a scientific hypothesis. Uh, he went above and beyond in the call for the call of science. I'm just saying that what I find disgusting is is nowhere near what this is. That's the, the extent. <laughs> I know. So, first hypothesis, and this is important, huh, uh, was that yellow fever was caused by excessive outdoor exercise during That's the summer. That's right. Those people getting outside, fresh air. The everything to not get sick is what caused you to get yellow fever, essentially. Yeah, staying fit and in shape, you know, mm-hmm. enjoying some strenuous exercise, play, getting going your for a walk in the park with the girl you've been courting for the past twenty six months, raising your natural endorphin levels mm-hmm. uh, and uh, testosterone. The nice, n- nice, uh, nice cocktail of absinthe and opium keep you. 
doing keep, about three keep your humors aligned. Do a couple hundred cartwheels and then drink a little bit. Do some high eye eyes as the calisthenic stretches. Yep. So he thought, well, that's how it happened because the contractions mm-hmm. of yellow fever would dip during winter months. Right. So he was like, what happens this during winter? Be- what happens during winter? Uh, it gets cold outside. He can't go outside. That's right. So he's like, I know what the cause is. People are outside. They're running around. They're 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 becoming fevered, mm-hmm. yellow fevered. Really, <laughs> really, what the cause of it was? It does have something to do with the temperature, but it does nothing to do with exercise. Yellow fever is spread by mosquitoes. Mm-hmm. We course, know know now. We know now. Stubbins <laughs> Firth was laughably insane. Is laughably in- Stubbins Firth is laughably insane to us. However, back in the day, he might have had. Um, a reasonable, reasonable thought. He was almost on to something, which almost. is what we find a lot in early science. Like, they get close, but then they go, wait a minute, I think I might have found a genetic, it's the devil! <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, Sam, why did he, if he was drinking infected people's vomit, smearing their bodily fluids into open cuts and things of that nature, why did he not get sick? An even crazier reason. Uh Uh-huh. It's speculated that the samples that he took from these victims that he smeared into his pores, Mm -hmm. um, that they were in the later stages of the virus. And therefore, it was no longer contagious. Why take infected blood from somebody who just got it when I can take blood and poop from this rotting corpse? But, ironically, it's what kept him from getting sick. That's right. And what he saw as the proof of his hypothesis. Now, Firth went on to publish his thesis in 1804, Anno Domini, uh, entitled A Treatise on Malignant Fever with an Attempt to Prove Its Non-Contagious, Non-Malignant Nature. <laughs> look, look, just look at me. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. No, I'm not sick. Here, pour that puke into my open cut. Yeah. I'm not sick. I wonder if I can do a butt chug of Ebola right now. <laughs> I got a keg filled with dung. I'm gonna. I'm gonna sleep shoot. in it for two weeks. I'm gonna. I'm gonna sleep in this barrel, this barrel of turds, yeah. and it's gonna prove to you that I'm smart. I've drank 17 gallons of cat, and I feel fantastic. <laughs>